Jaws is back with Michael Caine. Gallons of fake blood. Kind of a lot of sex talk. I'm counting on a long, happy sex life. <laughs> and a bunch of flashbacks. Smile, you son of a bitch. It's Jaws the Revenge, but is it watchable? Thank you, audience, that I add in post, and welcome everybody to Is It Watchable? I'm your host, Paul. If you like your movie monsters easily avoidable by, you know, not venturing out too far when you go to the beach, then this is the movie for you. 70s fashion might have left a lot to be desired, but 70s horror movies were on point. So many classics. The Exorcist, Halloween, Carrie, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Alien, Dawn of the Dead. I could go on forever, but maybe the coolest thing about 70s horror movies is that they seem to genuinely scare their audiences. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you can check out my video where I discuss whether movies today scare us as much as they used to. Now, we've all heard the stories of people fainting and throwing up during screenings of The Exorcist, but in 1975, another movie impacted people long after they left the theaters. Steven Spielberg's masterpiece Jaw swam onto the big screen and haunted beaches all over the world. Seriously, it was reported that beach attendance actually dropped significantly the summer it was released. Jaws is often recognized as the first summer blockbuster, which means it made a ton of money and we got a ton of sequels. 1978's Jaws 2 brought back much of the original cast and, while not horrible, was largely forgettable. 1983's Jaws 3D, or Jaws 3 on the other hand, was horrible. Just like this one, the fourth film in the series, Jaws The Revenge. Now, there's actually some debate as to which is worse, Jaws 3 or Jaws The Revenge, and I probably could have reviewed either, but... A movie about a shark that packs up and travels over a thousand miles because he's craving one particular family? That's what this show's all about. The movie opens with a bit of foreshadowing by way of a point of view shot of the latest version of Jaws, I guess that's the shark's name, as he stalks Amity Island. We're then reintroduced to Ellen Brody, the wife of police chief Martin Brody from Jaws and Jaws 2, and her son Sean. Next we learn Sean is a police officer just like his late father, who we learn died because of the giant portrait hanging at the station. Someone reports a log tangled up in a buoy out in the channel, and Sean heads out to clear it. But the whole thing looks like a setup, because Jaws is there waiting for him and rips his arm off before finishing the job. <laughs> That was by far the best scene in this movie, just really good filmmaking. The helplessness of being all alone, in the water, in the dark, knowing you're about to die, trying to call out to people you can see but who unfortunately can't hear you, effectively conveyed and chilling. Too bad it happens less than 10 minutes into this thing because there is nothing to look forward to from here. Anyway, after Ellen identifies the body, her other son Mike and his family fly up from the Bahamas to attend the funeral. Mike finds his mother staring blankly out into the distance like sad people in movies do for some reason. When she finally breaks from her trance, she accuses the shark of waiting for just the right moment to come back and murder Sean. It waited all this time and it came for him. Okay, aside from the obvious problem with her assertion that the shark would somehow have a vendetta against her family, in all the previous movies, the shark has died at the end. So what she's really implying is that this shark is avenging the deaths of those other sharks. What? Still believing that craziness, she demands it might quit his job as a marine biologist to stay away from the water. I want you to get out of the water. What? I want you to give up that terrible job. Later at Sean's funeral, we get the first of several sepia tone flashbacks to remind us just how far the franchise has fallen since the original Jaws. Next, Mike invites Ellen down to the Bahamas to get away for a little while. She declines, then she accepts. Down in the Bahamas, we meet Michael Caine's character, a pilot named Hoagie, whose name in a stroke of screenwriting genius kind of tells us everything we need to know about the character. Once they reach the house, Mike's daughter, Thea, goes out to play near the water, bringing Ellen to a full-blown panic. It's too dangerous, don't do that! Mike's wife Carla is an artist, and Mike shows Ellen one of her sculptures, but to Ellen it looks like he's being eaten by a shark. Later, Ellen tosses her fears to the wind and takes a swim. Not a good idea because she's attacked by a shark, but not because it's only a dream. The next day, Mike and his fellow marine biologists are out doing their thing using a pretty badass mini submarine. Then the next day after that is Christmas. By the way, all of this is taking place during the holidays. And the family, along with Mike's colleague, Jake and his wife, are opening presents. Sharp shirt, Jake. <laughs> hey, may your sex life be as busy as your shirt. Thank you. <laughs> Ellen abruptly walks out, either because she's thinking of her dead son or is uncomfortable hearing all the sex talk about her other son. Also, she's still insisting that Mike stay away from the water. And she might be onto something because look who shows up. In manner, his fin's tired. Later, Ellen is playing on the beach with Thea when she steps into the water and senses something a little sharky. 
Hoagie shows up in a boat and the two walk up and down the beach as Ellen tells him about the shark stalking her family. Either Hoagie likes his women crazy or it's not her mind he's after because soon they're up in the air flirting like teenagers. Then, to have more stuff happen, the two also attend a parade. Back out in the water, Jake is down in that sweet mini sub when you know who floats by. It completely ignores Jake and stays focused on its mission, eating the Brody family. <laughs> Meanwhile, back at the parade, Ellen feels a disturbance in the force. Mike and Jake decide to keep the shark a secret as not to cause a panic, especially with Ellen, who's looking less and less crazy as this movie gets more and more crazy. Knowing he's still grieving the death of his brother, Carla sees Mike staring sadly out the window and decides to cheer him up by flinging her underwear at him. To be honest, that would kind of work. And it does, and the two get it on. Later at a New Year's Eve party, Ellen apologizes to Mike for the way she's been acting. I've been a pain in the ass and I'm sorry. I'm not gonna bother you anymore about your work. Back at the office, Jake says he wants to track and study the shark. Mike initially refuses, but since that wouldn't be great for the movie's plot, he eventually agrees. Next, Mike and Carla are fighting about who should take out the garbage. Seriously. And then quickly make up and get it on again. Seriously. Later, Mike and Jake manage to attract the shark and stick a tracking device in it. Meanwhile, at one of those scenic beach restaurants, Hoagie and Ellen's relationship heats up. Out at sea, the chase is on as Mike and Jake attempt to locate the shark. But because this movie still needs to be a little longer, they lose the signal. Next, Carla and Ellen talk about their sex lives. You know, like all women do with their in-laws. I mean, I feel too old to be in this thing. I hope not. I mean, I am counting on a long, happy sex life. <laughs> that night, it's Michael's turn to have a nightmare because the movie has to squeeze in more sharks somehow. And the next night, Mike and Thea reenact that cute scene from the original Jaws, which doesn't come off as cute so much as it does desperate. After that, we're subjected to a lengthy heart-to-heart -heart between Ellen and Mike as she tries to turn his frown upside down. It worked on my smile. It's... It's your turn. The following day, Mike is cruising the ocean floor in that cool as mini minisub when Jake warns him that the shark is on its way. This time, the shark attacks the sub because it knows who's inside. The mini sub is destroyed and Mike takes refuge in a shipwreck. But this is no ordinary shark. This is Jaws, fool, and it straight up follows him in. Now, I know I said that scene at the beginning was the best in the movie, but this one ranks up there. I mean, that shot of the shark being all doo 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 coming down the hall, that is bad movie gold. Anyway, Mike gets away by using a scuba tank to propel to the surface, but he's understandably shaken up by the experience. So much so that he wakes up in the middle of the night to go look at himself in the mirror, like people in movies do for some reason. The next day, Carla's sculpture is unveiled at a ceremony on the beach where she allows Thea to go out and ride the banana boat with a friend. But she's not out there long before Ellen spots a large fin poking out of the water. Of course, the shark has his sight set on Thea, but he misses and ends up eating the woman seated behind her instead. Now Ellen is pissed and commandeers Mike's boat to lure the shark and I guess sacrifice herself. Soon, Mike, Jake, and Hoagie are up in his plane looking for her. Down in the water, the shark finds Ellen. Luckily, the guys spot her and just as the shark surfaces and take a chunk out of the boat, they scare it with a well-timed flyby. With little time to lose, they decide to make a water landing and swim for the boat. Unfortunately for Hoagie, the shark attacks before he can even jump into the water. He had two members of the Brody family like 50 feet away, so I guess the shark will attack other people when it's convenient to the plot. But you know that hoagie, he somehow escapes and is somehow barely wet. So now comes a time when they have to devise a plan to kill the shark. For this movie, it's a device that will drive the shark crazy with an electrical signal. Jake feeds the device to Jaws, but in the process gets himself eaten. So now it's up to Mike to make the shark crazy with electricity. The device works and Jaws jumps out of the water and somehow roars like a lion. Mike continues to activate the device until Ellen, having a bunch of flashback seizures, stabs Jaws with the boat's bowsprit. That pointy thing in the front. Jaws dies, everyone is happy, and Ellen heads back to Amity, confident her family is safe once and for all. But like I said before, the shark has died at the end of every single Jaws movie, which leads you to believe that there must be an entire family or an underwater street gang of sharks wanting to kill the Brodies. How can they be sure this is the last one? Jaws the Revenge, like a few other movies I've reviewed, Exorcist 2, Superman 4, Batman and Robin, illustrates just how far a franchise can fall no matter how great the first movie is. But to be fair, for Jaws, the cards were kind of already stacked against it. To come up with engaging sequels for movies where the heroes have to put themselves in danger by physically going out to where the shark is? The filmmakers had to get creative. Jaws 3D found a way to easily up the body count by unleashing the shark in SeaWorld. And of course, here in Jaws The Revenge, they make Jaws sort of a shark version of Jason Voorhees. Critics hated this movie and ripped it apart, pointing out its many ridiculous plot points. Roger Ebert found it laughable that Ellen would have flashbacks to events where she wasn't even present. While others pointed out that sharks can't roar, swim over a thousand miles in just a few days, or be capable of targeting a single family for revenge. But I don't think those points are really fair. I mean, I mentioned Jason Voorhees. Jaws is no more a normal shark than Jason is a normal human being. And this isn't so much a shark movie as it is a monster movie. Not a good monster movie, but a monster movie. 
Probably one of the funniest quotes that's critical of the movie comes from one of its actors. Michael Caine said, I have never seen it, but by all accounts, it is terrible. However, I have seen the house that it built, and it is terrific. Also, the ending of this movie might be a little different depending on how you watch it. If you watch it on Netflix, you get the original theatrical ending I just showed you where the shark dies by being stabbed by the boat. If you watch it on Amazon, you get the foreign release and home video ending where the shark gets stabbed by the boat and then straight up explodes. What? The new ending was reportedly shot because American audiences didn't like the original ending. I guess it wasn't explodey enough. Also in the new ending, Jake is found wounded, but alive. Which was pretty cool for an 80s film because back then, if there was a group of people in a movie and one of them was black, you pretty much knew who was going to die. But instead of a victim, Jake here looks like a complete badass for surviving a monster shark attack. Anyway, Jaws of Revenge. Is it watchable? Like, maybe if it's the only entertainment option you have? But like, if there's even an old copy of Teen Vogue laying around? Read the magazine. About the only things this movie has going for it is that it's well shot, the underwater scenes and the tropical setting are captured beautifully, and the acting is passable. But, and I've said this about other films I've reviewed, that there's not much there or there's not enough movie to fill out its runtime, well, this might be the most egregious example yet. After the first shark attack, it's pretty much just a waiting game for the inevitable climactic showdown where they face off and kill the shark. If you've seen any of the other Jaws movies, you know what I mean. And honestly, knowing what to expect at the end is fine if getting there is fun, but Jaws Revenge is anything but fun. Most of its runtime is spent wallowing in boring relationship drama to flesh out parallel storylines that have little to no bearing on the plot and that don't get resolved in any meaningful way. So much of it feels designed to just kill time between shark sequences and to ensure that it's long enough to be called a movie. And as far as those shark sequences go, you've seen them all before, but only with better special effects and a lot less stupid. It's kind of sad really because a film about a murderous shark with a vendetta that stalks a family wherever they go? That should be so bad it's good any day. But it's not. Well that's all I've got. Join me next time when I check out the animation abomination that is the Emoji Movie. And if you would, help me out. Subscribe.